Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to class five of our Adult Gospel Project. We are glad you are joining us online, and we just pray that this has been a blessing to you and has certainly, we certainly hope that it has helped you grow in Christ. This week, as we enter into Easter Sunday, um, we kind of take a break from what we've been going through, and we're going to look at this account in the, the Gospel of John, and we're going to look through the eyes of Mary and what the Scriptures teach us how she, the emotions she went through and what actually happened when she ran to the tomb. So this session is called From Despair to Joy. And so as I lay out that title for you, I want you to consider and think about in your life, because there will be some questions here that we get to answer together, um, the times of despair in your life and then what it took to get you back to a time of joy. Um, or those moments when you had a time of despair, but you still had the joy of Christ. So be thinking about those times because as we look at this session, we're going to look at Mary and her um, experience in losing her Savior and coming to the tomb and seeing him gone um, and what that means for us as well. And so the session in a sentence for this session is Christ's crucifixion and resurrection is the anchor of salvation and the motivation to live with joy, hope, and purpose. Um, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is not only the cornerstone of the gospel, but also the source of joy and hope for all believers. Because Jesus died to pay the penalty of sin and rose again, we have good news to share with others. So go ahead and open your books up to page 47 in your daily discipleship guide and read along with me this top paragraph. Good news and bad news. In life, we hear both good and bad news on an everyday basis. Based on recent studies, roughly four out of five people prefer to hear the bad news first when it comes to situations where there is both positive and negative information to acknowledge. Why? In summary form, research seems to indicate that human beings prefer to process information with conclusions that leave us, leave us with a sense of meaning, transcendence, and poignancy. In other words, endings that elevate. So get ready to hit pause and think through this, and maybe if you're watching this with someone, ask this question and answer this question. Do you prefer to hear good news or the bad news first and why? So if someone comes to you and say, I have good news and bad news, what do you want to hear? What is your choice? I think I relate with this most of the time. I'd say nine times out of ten personally, I'm going to want to hear the bad news first. Give me the bad news so I can deal with it. Then give me the good news so I can elevate my spirit, so I can have something to look forward to. Um, I think if you get the good news first, it's kind of a letdown, and the good news may not be quite as good as you first thought it was. So that's just personally. What do you think? What would you rather hear? The good news first or the bad news first? The empty tomb and missing body of Jesus did not amount to good news for Jesus' disciples initially, but instead left them in confusion and despair. However, the disillusionment that Jesus' death had brought them soon gave way to ecstatic realization and seeing and hearing that seeing and hearing that the Lord was risen. In this session, we will consider John's narrative of Mary Magdalene's first encounter with Jesus following his burial. The despair Mary felt from Jesus' death on the cross was only compounded by the absence of his body from the tomb. Yet upon hearing her teacher's voice, Mary's disposition dramatically changed. Jesus wasn't missing. He was risen. As it did with Mary, recognition of the resurre resurrected Son of God leads us to being on mission for the resurrected Son of God. Point one is this, the despair over the crucified Christ. So point one, the despair over the crucified Christ. Let's go ahead and read 
John chapter 20, verses 11 through 13. But Mary stood outside the tomb, crying. As she was crying, she stooped, stooped to look into the tomb. She saw two angels in white sitting where Jesus' body had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you crying? Because they have taken away my Lord, she told them, and I don't know where they've put him. On page 48, let's read that first paragraph together. Mary Magdalene, whom Jesus had freed from the presence of demons, you can check out Luke chapter 8, verse 2, went to Jesus' tomb seeking her Lord's presence during a distressing time. Though her intuition to go to Jesus was good, the obvious problem with her plan was that, at least in her mind, Jesus was still dead. As was often the case with Jesus' disciples, and with us, Mary felt a certain attachment to Jesus, but did not believe in his power to conquer even death. Not in that moment, at least. Despite her misunderstanding of Jesus' final destiny, her longing to see Jesus was profoundly good and right. Consider the honesty of John's account and how Jesus' followers discovered that the tomb was empty. It does not paint them as being perceptive about the unfolding of the events. John's gospel was not written to venerate the disciples as a competent bunch. In verses 11 13 in particular, Mary Magdalene's initial reaction to the reality of the empty tomb was despair and confusion. Not the response of someone who was confident in her Lord's foretelling of his impending betrayal, arrest, execution, and eventual resurrection. She didn't seem to put any stock in Jesus' foretelling of these events and his accuracy regarding his own death. He lays this out in Matthew chapter 12, Matthew chapter 16, Matthew chapter 20. Per the usual, the Bible's depiction of the people God uses at pivotal points in his plan is not flattering, but truthful. The angel's presence inside the tomb did not tip off Mary that something unusual was happening. This might have been because the two angels seemed to look like men dressed in white. Nonetheless, these angels initiated a conversation with Mary, one that would eventually result in her despair turning into joy. More on that later. But we should note here that the angels, in whatever form they took at that moment, whether supernatural or modest, were not enough to deter her sorrow, for she desired above all else to see and be with the Lord Jesus. So let's ask this question. And let's answer this question. During a distressing time, what tends to be your default attitude, behavior, or recourse? So during a distressing time, what tends to be your default attitude, behavior, or recourse? I know for me personally, I react in two different ways. Um, the first way I react is if I'm tired or deflated and a distress comes on me, um, I get distressed and I can easily take that out on anyone in my way. So maybe it's the kids in the house. Maybe they didn't put their bowls up after they ate cereal. Maybe they didn't pick their clothes up. And I can take a distressing time and start seeing all the things in my immediate life, my immediate context, and, and try to at least control them because I've lost control. That's one way I do it. I'm not proud about that, but I, that is something that the Lord is at work in me. The second thing is I try to escape. That if there's a distressing time on me, and it used to be back when I was a teenager and in college when gas was a lot cheaper, I would get in my car and I'd just go driving down country roads and I'd just be in nature and I'd walk around and I'd get out of everything around here and be by myself and I just needed to be away from everyone. And so those are a couple of ways that... I deal with distressing time. What about you? How do you act during a distressing time? Go ahead and go to page 48 in your daily discipleship guide in the second paragraph. Read along with me. Those of us who are familiar with the four gospel accounts of the, rex of the resurrection sometimes neglect these narratives. Significance for coping with death. Death is always sad, even in the case of Jesus. While we should not criticize Mary for expressing sorrow over Jesus' death, 
we nonetheless should learn from her example and avoid living as if sorrow is the final outcome. Because of the truth of the gospel, death doesn't get the last word. With Jesus, there is hope beyond the grave. Mary would soon learn this firsthand. Though unaware of the resurrection as a fact, Mary had laid a hold upon the supreme principle from which, it necess- from which its necessity flows. Once given the intimate bond of faith between a sinner and his Savior, there can be no death to such a relationship. Mary, in her simple dependence on Jesus, had risen to the point where she sought him in life and sought it ever more abundantly. From Mary's experience, let us learn to do better. What the Lord expects from us at such season is not that we abandon ourselves to unreasoning sorrow, but trustingly to look sorrow in the face, to scan its features, to search for the help and hope, which as surely as God is our Father, must be there. In such trials, there can be no comfort for us as long as we stand outside weeping. If only we will take the courage to fix our gaze deliberately upon the stern and the stem, a countenance of grief, and enter unafraid into the darkest recesses of our trouble, we shall find terror gone, because the Lord has been there before us, and, coming out again, has left the place transfigured, making out of it, by the grace of his resurrection, a house of life, the very gate of heaven. Death is undeniably sad, and Mary's emotions about Jesus' death this time are certainly understandable. However, she had not lingered and peered into the empty tomb long enough. What Mary had yet to realize was that with Jesus, death is never the final outcome. Instead, resurrection is. Life does not give way to death. In Christ, death gives way to life forevermore. The bad news precedes the good news. Death precedes resurrection. So let me ask you this and consider this question and answer it honestly. When have you prematurely abandoned hope only to see later how God was moving you toward deeper resurrection hope? Let me ask that again. When have you prematurely abandoned hope only to see later how God was moving you toward deeper resurrection hope? Um, I think of one thing for me uh, personally is I lost my mom about 15 years ago. It was on a Thursday. It was out of the blue. Um, She was 56 and pretty decent health. And, um, you know, I remember everything about that day. Um, I I talk about this occasionally. And um, I remember being in a panic when I got the phone call from my dad. Um, telling me to get get down to Washington to to get get to the hospital something was wrong, and I remember that initial panic and I remember crying out to God and praying and Christine was in the car with me praying, and of course um, it was too too late for those prayers to be answered. But as I got to the hospital and I saw my mom and I saw my dad and I saw my aunt and my cousin, um, because of Christ because of His conquering death and his ascension to heaven and his promises to be with us and to raise us to life, I knew that that wasn't the end. And so I had hope in that moment. Now that's pretty extreme. It may not be as extreme for you, but I think we all can relate with people in our lives who um, are gone, who have died. And the hope that we have is that in Christ, um, we'll be resurrected too, and we will see them again, and we'll get to be with Christ. Let's move on to point two. Point one was the despair over the crucified Christ. And point two is this, the recognition of the risen Savior. So first comes the despair that Christ had died um, and longing for him. And then point two is this, that we would recognize the risen Savior. Let's read John chapter 20, verses 14 through 16. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know it was Jesus. Woman. Jesus said to her, Why are you crying? Who is that? Who is it that you're seeking? Supposing he was the gardener, she replied, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you've put him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary, turning around, she said to him in Aramaic, 
Rabboni, which means teacher. On page 49, your first paragraph, he said her name. That's all it took. In order to raise Mary's countenance and bring forth resurrection faith in her, Mary had to hear him say her name. No, it wasn't the gardener as she was first supposed it to be. It was the second and last Adam, the one who came to undo the thorns and thistles. The first Adam left with us. Mary knew at that moment that she was speaking with her teacher, her Lord. When the risen Jesus calls our name, we know in the very core of our being precisely who is speaking to us. In John 10, Jesus referred to himself as the Good Shepherd. Um, many of you are familiar with Psalm 23, but you're probably not as familiar, familiar with Ezekiel 34. And this is a passage showing how the shepherds of Israel were taking advantage of the people of Israel, the sheep. And so we get a better picture of what it means to be the good shepherd versus the bad shepherd that Israel was used to. If Jesus is our shepherd and we are his sheep, then we know his voice and know it distinctly from the voices of strangers. Moreover, Jesus told the Jewish establishment of his day that they did not believe him to be the Messiah because they were not of his sheep. Jesus then made the point in more positive terms. He says, my sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. This is true for us and was true for Mary. In calling out to her, the good shepherd who had laid down his life for his sheep was demonstrating that he had also taken up his life again. Here's an illustration to help kind of put this um, in a little better picture. Parents should be able to resonate with the shepherd sheep analogy. Children from an early point in their development, even from the womb, are thought to be able to recognize their parents' voices. Hearing sounds by week 16 of gestation, a baby can begin to distinguish his or her father's voice from inside the womb at about 32 weeks as most research indicates. The baby thus continues to recognize his or her father's voice once born. As babies have the natural capacity to discern a paternal voice from among others, so do Jesus' disciples have the supernatural capacity to distinguish their Savior's voice from a sea of competing chatter. On page 49, the second paragraph, it says this, like the disciples on the Emmaus Road, you can check that out in Luke chapter 24, Mary did not recognize Jesus immediately. Just as Jesus' breaking and blessing of bread prompted the two disciples to realize Jesus was reclining with them, Jesus caused Mary to realize who was speaking to her by saying her name. Similar to how the two disciples perceived Jesus to be among them in the breaking of bread, we should recognize that Jesus is with us as we take the bread and the cup in the Lord's Supper. And as Mary heard Jesus calling to her near the empty tomb, we likewise should hear his voice calling to us in and through the scriptures. Here's an application for us. While we have not laid eyes on or touched the risen Jesus physically as did the first disciples, we nonetheless have access to him through God's word. And his church's ordinance, sometimes called sacraments, namely baptism and the Lord's Supper. Let's check out like the Bible. Jesus taught that the scriptures bore witness of him, referring specifically to what we know today as the Old Testament. As an extension of his ministry, Jesus authorized the apostles and their associates to provide for the church with doctrine and instruction subsequent to his resurrection and ascension, which in written form came to be known collectively as the New Testament. Thus, in order to know the truthfulness of the resurrection and encounter the risen Jesus, the Bible itself proves sufficient for us. Let's look at baptism. Immersion in water does not in itself save us, but baptism points to the grounds of our salvation, specifically our union by grace through faith with the risen and exalted Christ. When we receive baptism or witness someone else being baptized, we are, we are observing a sign of salvation that depicts the reality of salvation obtained for us in Jesus' death and resurrection. Every time the church baptizes a repentant sinner, we are proclaiming, He is risen, He is risen indeed. And let's look at the Lord's Supper. 
Jesus identified his body with the bread and his blood with the cup. The fact that we are to continue this practice until Jesus returns thus incorporates the belief that he rose from the dead. We are not merely honoring a life that has come and gone, but instead, in the Lord's Supper, we are communing with the resurrected Jesus and with fellow believers through the Holy Spirit by the consecrated use of these sacred symbols. They're pictures to remind us of the resurrected Christ. So let's ask you this question. Think through this and answer this. Why do you think we often overlook how the risen Jesus is made present to us in God's word and in the church's ordinances. Let me ask that again. Why do you think we often overlook how the risen Jesus is made present to us in God's word and in the church's ordinances? Sometimes it's just because we're so used to it, we kind of go through the motions. This is what we're supposed to do, right? Sometimes we're just not taught well the biblical implication of the church's ordinances. Sometimes we churches don't do a good job of explaining what we're doing and why we're doing it. Sometimes we forget Jesus' promise to be with us until the end of the age. And what a beautiful promise that is, that I will never leave you. I will never forsake you, but I will be with you. And sometimes we just don't think we need Jesus' presence. But we certainly do. Let's move on to point three. So we looked at the despair that turns to joy. We looked at the recognition of the risen Savior. And point three is this, the mission given by the Son of God. The mission given by the Son of God. Let's read together John chapter 20, verses 17 through 18 says this, Don't cling to me, Jesus told her, since I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and tell them that I am ascending to my Father, and your Father, to my God, and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them what he had said to her. On page 50 in the first paragraph of your books, Jesus said, don't cling to me. Why was it good that Jesus went away? Put simply, if Jesus didn't leave, then the Holy Spirit wouldn't come. While the Holy Spirit was active throughout the Old Testament, the Spirit came in a more spectacular way following Jesus' ascension. Pentecost, as recorded in Acts chapter 2, marked the dawn of a new age, an age where Jesus had officially, officially taken the throne as the Messiah at the Father's right hand, ruling his kingdom and empowering his disciples for mission by the Spirit. We read, since I have not yet ascended to the Father. When we read that and hear often about the cross and the resurrection, but we seldom focus on the importance of Jesus' ascension. In order to get some perspective about the significance and purpose of Jesus' ascension, theologian Michael F. Byrd offers the following seven points. One, Jesus ascended to heaven so that he can send the Holy Spirit to his followers. This is in John chapter 7, John chapter 14, John chapter 15, and John chapter 16. Point two, after Jesus ascended, there was an expectation that his followers would worship Jesus and witness to him. Matthew chapter 28, Luke chapter 24, Acts chapter 1. Point three, Jesus' ascension means that he has been exalted to the Father's right hand and received divine authority. Psalm 110.1 Daniel chapter 7, Matthew 26, Acts 2, Philippians 2. Point 4. The ascension demonstrated that God placed, God placed a human being as his representat- representative ruler over creation. Genesis 1, Psalm 8, Hebrews 1. And point 5. Believers have begun to share in the reign of Jesus by virtue of their union with him. Luke 22, Ephesians 2, Colossians 3. Point six, Jesus' work of intercession continued in his heavenly session. Hebrews 10, Romans 8. And point seven, Jesus will return in the same manner that he left. Acts 1, verse 11. 
It's time to fill in the blanks. This is an essential doctrine called Christ's exaltation. So what the Bible teaches us about Christ's exaltation. So get your pens out, get ready to fill in these blanks. Whereas the death of Christ was the ultimate example of his humiliation, the resurrection of Christ from the dead is the first and glorious example of Christ's exaltation. Christ was exalted when God raised him from the dead. Christ was exalted when God raised him from the dead. And Christ was exalted when he ascended to the Father's right hand. Christ was exalted when he ascended to the Father's right hand. He will be exalted by all creation when he returns. He will be exalted by all creation when he returns. All of these aspects work together to magnify the glory and worth of Christ, resulting in the praise of the glory of his grace in rescuing sinners. On page 50, the second paragraph says, It's one thing to see an empty tomb. It's another thing to see our risen Lord. The pattern that is true of Mary in this passage should be true of us. Recognizing the risen Jesus leads to being on mission for the risen Jesus. Though the risen Jesus doesn't appear before us in his glorified, glorified flesh as he did for Mary, the same resurrected Jesus nonetheless has transformed us through the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, go to my brothers when he was talking to Mary. We should take note that Jesus refers to the disciples as my brothers when speaking to Mary. Jesus considered his disciples to be family, those who share a common God and a common Father. We, as Jesus' disciples, receive a new identity and status by our common faith in him. We become children of God entitled to call God our Father through our adoption in the eternal Son of God. Jesus says, To my God and your God, not only does Jesus speak here about his impending ascension, but also about his relationship to the Father, and by extension, our relationship to the Father. Jesus is the unique Son of God who is equal to God and the Father, according to his divine nature. And yet, he can also refer to the Father as his God, according to his human nature. Thus, we can say of Jesus, like Thomas several verses later, My Lord and my God. Yet we should also confess that we worship the same God as does Jesus, our brother in humanity. And then he said this, Jesus said in those passages we read, I have seen the Lord. Mary heeded Jesus' instructions not to cling to him by leaving um, to announce his resurrection to the disciples. Mary had seen Jesus for the first time since he died. Only now he was no longer a lifeless corpse. Thus she was moved to announce her siding of the risen Savior to the other disciples. Question, what are some ways Jesus' exaltation relates to our mission to proclaim the gospel? What are some ways Jesus' exaltation and being exalted to heaven, raised from the dead, ascended to the throne, how does that relate to our mission to proclaim the gospel? couple of thoughts. One, apart from Jesus' resurrection, we wouldn't have any good news to proclaim. Not any real good news, because at the end of our lives, we would die and have nothing to look forward to. Jesus' ascension preceded the coming of the Holy Spirit, who gives us direction, words, and power, that the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead, according to Romans chapter 8, verse 11, lives in us and empowers us. We proclaim Jesus as our living Savior and Lord, who rules over all things from the Father's right hand. And he'll complete the extent of his rule when he comes again. We know he's in control and he's coming back. And then the last way for us um, to proclaim this in light of Jesus' exaltation is evangelism, which is just sharing good news. right? Sharing good news with those around you is exalting the risen Savior before those who do not yet believe in him and the salvation he accomplished for us. So we always have to be aware that when we're sharing Christ with people, we're sharing what um, this good news is that 
we've sinned against a holy God. We're guilty before a holy God. We are um, stand in judgment towards this holy God. That he made a way for us. And that he sent his son to live the lives that we couldn't live. And he did it perfectly. And that he was crucified. And on the cross, he took upon God's wrath for our sin. And then he died. And then he was raised again on the third day, conquering death. And then he was ascended to heaven. The good news for you and I is that we get to participate in that. Now, we share that with people, but we also share our faith in that same Jesus that did that same thing for us. So there's two parts. There's the part of proclaiming the gospel, the good news, and then there's the part of sharing our testimony, our witness. What, why do we believe this? What hope do we have in this? And so we do those combined. That leads us to proclaim the good news in its fullest context. Like Mary Magdalene, we must face the grim reality that is death. However, also like Mary, we can stare back at death without fear and despair because we share with her, risen, with her a risen Savior who conquered death. And again, like Mary, knowing the resurrected Jesus compels us to tell others about him who has ascended to the Father. After the, des the despair of death comes the joy of the resurrection. As for Mary and for us, death is part of the bad news. But thankfully, this isn't the whole story. Death hurts, yes, but its effect is not final when Jesus is on the scene. So often, this fallen world brings upon us a downward countenance. The truth of Jesus' resurrection and ascension is forever. It lifts our heads. Since our risen Lord has called each of us by name, we must respond like Mary did, by heeding our teacher's instructions to go and tell. Christian, why are you crying? With eyes of faith, you too can say, I have seen the Lord. Now on your last page here, we just take all of this, the resurrection of Christ, the death of Christ, the resurrection of Christ, the despair, the bad news, the good news that he rose again, and now we're empowered to go and share the story. So what are we going to do with it? What's our response to this? Because it's not just something we need to only internalize, but it needs to continue to transform our hearts and our minds and change it so that this news is something that we share. Because the resurrection of Jesus proves he defeated sin and death on our behalf, we fulfill our mission of sharing the gospel with others, telling how we have come to know and love Jesus. So how will you respond? Here's three questions to consider and how you'll respond this week to the good news of the resurrection of Jesus. How will you respond in faith to the true historical bodily resurrection of Jesus? How will you respond to that? Two, what are some practices our church and our group can develop to regularly remind one another about the presence and authority of the risen Jesus in our lives. And then one, way, one more question to think through and respond is, with whom will you share the good news of Jesus' crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension? This is good news. It's worthy to be shared. Not to be held in, not to be afraid of how someone might receive it or reject us, but to simply tell them, there's a Jesus who died for you, who loves you, and has offered you a new life. And we have to do that. I hope this has been encouraging to you as we enter into Easter this week. What hope that you and I have as believers in Christ. Let's pray together and uh, we'll finish our session. Father, thank you for saving us from death and lifting us from despair through your son's resurrection. God, we praise you for giving us tangible proof of your faithfulness with the gospel records of eyewitnesses and testimony to not only the empty tomb, but also to the risen Jesus. Help us by the Holy Spirit to hear our risen Savior's voice in Scripture so that we might obey his commission to go and tell others about him. God, I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thanks for joining us, and uh, we'll see you guys next week. God bless.